Good evening, I'm Andrew Chang. And I'm Adrian Arsenault. Tonight, another promising vaccine makes waves. It's a good protein to make the vaccines against. So how soon and how much will answer your questions. We are drowning right now. Worries about hospital capacity. Why doctors in Manitoba fear the worst. We have raised the issue both uh, publicly and privately. New tensions in Canada-China relations. And my conversation with Aurora James. When we talk about supporting Black-owned businesses in a really meaningful way like that, we're also talking about supporting Black communities. The Canadian woman behind the 15% pledge. This is The National. This pandemic is sending out bad news in waves, and there's plenty of that to be had tonight, including that Canada has now passed 300,000 COVID cases, 100,000 in the last month. But we want to start with something hopeful. A second coronavirus vaccine is showing very promising results. This one is by Moderna. And while Canada already has a deal for millions of doses, the vaccine isn't ready yet. So today, the message from health experts, don't let your guard down. Don't let the good news further fuel the bad news. And that good news sent markets soaring today. The Dow Jones closing at a record high. So how does this vaccine work? How does it compare to the other one that's been getting buzz? Vicodopia walks us through it. The early numbers surpassed even the company's expectations. 30,000 human volunteers injected with the experimental vaccine or a placebo, nearly 95% effective. That was really a, a stunning realization. There were 11 cases of severe disease, but all 11 were on placebo. None of the vaccine recipients had had severe COVID-19. Three months ago, we were saying, will there be a vaccine? Can we actually make a vaccine? Other scientists are eager to see the full data. If it holds up, it'll validate a new technology never used before in vaccines. What that shows is that you can, uh, the spike protein on which these vaccines are based looks like it's, it's a good protein to make the vaccines against. It's called messenger RNA technology. It uses genetic signals to trick the immune system into producing antibodies that attack the virus's spike protein, killing the virus. The news comes exactly a week after Pfizer and BioNTech also announced early findings. Both vaccine candidates use messenger RNA technology. They claim to be highly effective. Both require two shots, 28 days apart, and the Canadian government had already pre-ordered 56 million doses from Moderna and 20 million from Pfizer, with an option for millions more. Moderna has one major advantage over Pfizer. Its vaccine has a longer shelf life and can be stored in common medical freezers, while Pfizer's has to be kept at minus 70. How do you cold chain that, you know, from the manufacturer to where it's administered? And then how do you maintain it before you give it, you know, as a vaccine? So I think even though the two vaccines are, you know, similarly effective at immune protection, one is sort of winning out on practical scale. Just one of the logistical challenges to overcome when vaccinations are expected to begin next year. Vicodopia, CBC News, Toronto. Okay, so we have infectious diseases specialist Dr. Zane Chagla joining us because, Dr. Chagla, I guess now we have two potentially viable candidates, right? Does that translate into more Canadians being able to get the vaccine sooner? Yeah, I mean, we started with zero two weeks ago, so this is obviously an improvement. I think it, it means that all those downstream issues like supply chain, rollout, you know, anything that could hold up a vaccine, we have an insurance plan that we have two potentially effective vaccines that get to the market. It probably does mean we have double the supply, and hopefully it does mean that we are able to vaccinate more Canadians in a rapid manner, at least focusing more on, again, the vulnerable Canadians and healthcare workers and spreading out to the general population, hopefully right. in, again, a faster manner. And, and that the vaccine not only seems to grant immunity, but also that, that people who did get sick didn't get as sick. I mean, is that surprising? I mean, that's that's bonus. I mean, we do see this with some vaccinations like the influenza vaccine. Uh, you know, again, even Moderna and Pfizer had people who got the vaccine who still got COVID. But it's at least reassuring that even if that happens, the odds are that that person is still going to have a mild illness, which just adds to the benefit of these vaccines, hopefully. Dr. Chagla, great to get your insight. Thank you so much. No problem.
And Dr. Chagler will be back along with Dr. Susie Hoda to take on some of the skeptics out there. There are entirely legitimate concerns that many folks have about the vaccine, which we will speak to a bit later. So every day we wait for a safe, effective vaccine is measured in human lives. Already far too many are dying, and the math here going into winter is pretty bleak. Canada now averages nearly 4,800 reported cases per day, a rate of growth that's more than double what it was a month ago. Perhaps even more alarming, average daily COVID-19 deaths have doubled too, but this is just over the past two weeks, from about 30 to now more than 60 deaths a day. Now, the epidemic in Manitoba is expanding at the fastest rate per capita in the country and has been for weeks. Now that COVID wave is overwhelming hospitals. The rate of newly reported cases really started to skyrocket in mid-October. Within about two weeks, hospitals saw a surge of severe cases. It was at the beginning of this month. Manitoba doctors began sounding the alarm, but since then, COVID hospitalizations have nearly doubled. So now, as Cameron McIntosh tells us, doctors are pleading with the public while health officials consider more extreme measures. As hospitalizations climb, these surgical recovery beds are being converted to ICU beds in Winnipeg. We are drowning right now. Anesthesiologist Renate Singh is on the front lines, seeing the crush of COVID cases. It is definitely a public responsibility to try to slow down the transmission of the virus and help us on this end. Of the 90 ICU beds in the province, half are filled with COVID patients. Over the weekend, COVID cases overwhelmed the ER in Steinbach. Some patients transferred three hours away. The reality is, is the system is, at this point, seems to be quite on the verge of being completely overloaded. We are for freedom of choice. Yet, just down the street, an anti-mask protest, with some arguing personal and religious freedoms. I would say to the folks who were there, it was a book I have a lot of time for. And uh, one of the things I always hold high in that book is a phrase that says, thou shalt not kill. Maybe you could reflect on that a little bit. While the Saturday paper expanded its obituary section, this weekend big box stores allowed to stay open for essentials did a lot of non-essential business in a province supposedly in lockdown. Don't mistake frustration for a lack of resolve. He's promising tighter restrictions on shopping, stricter enforcement of health orders. All while frustrated health officials keep hammering, futilely it seems, those sordid stats. In the last three days, we've announced more than a thousand cases. We uh, can't sustain this number of cases in our healthcare system. People are dying. Our healthcare system is straining. If the surge here continues, the province says contingencies may be necessary, like turning ice rinks into temporary hospitals even morgues. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. Health officials in British Columbia have reported nearly 2,000 new cases since Friday. Today we have seen that much of the transmission is occurring in private homes, at social gatherings, and in settings like workplaces where people are gathering together. The majority of cases continue to be in the Lower Mainland where people have been under strict restrictions on social gatherings. Meanwhile, neighboring Alberta reported a record of daily COVID deaths. 20 new deaths over the past 24 hours. These are not just numbers. These are people. Dr. Hinshaw says the measures in place right now are genuinely a matter of life and death and that more restrictions may be needed in the weeks ahead. Alberta also added 860 new cases today. So since the pandemic began, Canada's north has had only a handful of cases. But Nunavut is now going into a COVID-19 lockdown. Jackie McKay tracks a situation that changed suddenly and dramatically. Only three communities in Nunavut have confirmed cases. Rankin Inlet, Sunny Kilowak and Arviat. But it's Arviat that has officials worried most, where there is signs of community transmission. It reported its first case on Friday. Now it has 20. Arviat's mayor is urging people not to panic. We asked people not to spread rumors or point fingers. No one wanted this. 
no one wanted to be the first person to have it. Starting on Wednesday, everyone in Nunavut will be under strict measures. All schools, recreation facilities, bars and restaurants will close. Everyone except for essential workers will be working from home. And the government is advising against any non-essential travel. Nunavut's chief public health officer says finding the source of the new infections isn't his focus now. The work required to do that might be counterproductive at this point. Our biggest effort is going into stopping transmission right now. To prevent COVID from coming into these three Nunavut communities, anyone who's been down south self-isolates for two weeks in Winnipeg hotels. Those Winnipeg isolation hubs may have become part of the problem. There are reports of people breaching quarantine. For eight months, it has worked. For eight months, it's helped us keep this virus out. Isolation only works if people follow the rules while isolating. Follow the isolation hub rules. But with the specter of community transmission, health officials fear it's only a matter of time before the virus spreads further. Jackie McKay, CBC News, Iqaluit. There are now outbreaks in more than 100 Ontario long-term care homes. But critics say the main move from the province today wasn't to protect seniors from COVID-19. It was to protect homes from COVID-19 lawsuits. Katie Nicholson explains. My mother was always well-dressed, very, very elegant. Dementia couldn't steal Malvina Shabe's style or grit. The pandemic was another matter. My mother, being a Holocaust survivor, survived atrocities and something like COVID in a few days just took her away from us. Jeff Shabes is speaking out because he wants other families to know it's up to them to advocate for their loved ones in care. My mother had symptoms for three days before I knew about it, and I only knew because of a, of a call from by FaceTime. She had cold sores, she was coughing terribly, and a running nose. Classic symptoms. It took four days to get the test results. Three days after that, she was dead. It's absolutely heartbreaking um, to see the numbers rise. Ontario's not-for-profit long-term care homes say testing has to improve. It's taking too long to get test results back. There's been a slight improvement, and in some parts of the province it seems better, but it could take three to four days to get a test result back, which is three to four days too long. The Premier knows it's a problem. We need 100% testing across the board to literally lock the long-term care down. It's not clear when testing will be locked down, though the province is pumping $540 million into combating COVID in homes. Bill, Bill, 218. But today, it also passed new legislation, making sure families can't sue homes that fail to protect residents. They're trying to protect themselves from these people who have dealt with such tragedy, such anguish. The kind of anguish Jeff Shabes knows too well. The feeling of helplessness is just something that I can't describe. Helplessness that's growing, along with the risk to those most vulnerable to the virus. Katie Nicholson, CBC News, Toronto. We now know how much it costs to send Canadian soldiers into long-term care homes in the spring. About $53 million. CBC News obtained that figure from the Department of National Defence. As deaths mounted in the spring, the military was sent into 54 homes in Ontario and Quebec. Today, officers told the House of Commons committee lessons learned then will help in future crises, including the use of personal protective equipment. Well, defence lawyers began making their case today in the murder trial of Alec Manassian. He has admitted to carrying out a deadly van attack in Toronto two years ago, but he has pleaded not guilty to all charges. Joanna Romiliota shows us how a controversial strategy hinges on a diagnosis of autism. A lack of remorse. The defense argued this is evidence of it. Alec Manassian alone in a police interrogation room, seemingly unfazed by what he had done. Just hours before, Manassian had driven a rented van into pedestrians, killing 10 people and injuring 16 others. But the defense argues he is not criminally responsible because he could not appreciate what he did was wrong. In a trial held in virtual court, Manassian's lawyer presented his client's diagnosis of autism as the basis of his defense and questioned his father. 
Vahemanassian told the court his son was gentle, but rarely showed empathy and didn't understand consequences of his actions. I was starting to feel radicalized at that time. He also testified his son's claims that he was inspired by extreme misogynist ideology seemed like he was reciting something he had read, as he often tended to do. This legal expert says the defense has a high threshold to meet. I think it really comes down to that distinction between intellectually knowing that something is wrong and being able to apply that knowledge in a way where you are rationally making a decision and knowing that it is wrong. The Crown argued Manassian grew up in a loving home, would have known killing people was wrong. Oh, hi. Good to see you there. And presented a school project video to make the case he had the capacity to think critically. Autism is not defined by violence. And advocates say autism shouldn't be part of this legal defense. Autism shouldn't be on trial, but that there are other contributing factors perhaps that we're not aware of that would come together um, to make someone act in this manner. Manassian's father broke down when he told the court he keeps wondering what signs he missed and says he can only conclude his son didn't truly understand what he did. A defense the Crown will continue to challenge when court resumes tomorrow. Joanna Rumeliotis, CBC News, Toronto. Huawei executive Meng Wanzhou was back in court today. Her lawyers continue to argue against the validity of her arrest at the Vancouver airport just under two years ago. That arrest was on behalf of the United States, where she faces fraud charges. Today brought some fresh speculation from international relations experts that the incoming Biden administration might be less aggressive on this case, given Canada's urgings to consider its two citizens held by China since shortly after Meng's arrest. But now there are new tensions in that Canada-China relationship. After comments made on the CBC News program, Rosemary Barton Live. Bob Ray, Canada's ambassador to the UN, talked about a religious minority in China many believe are oppressed or much worse. Evan Dyer has the latest. China says the massive camps in its western region are for re-education. Uyghur activists say images like these present a sanitized version of what's really going on. Many Uyghurs, they lost their members of their family. Not only parents are locked up in concentration camps and the children taken away. The Uyghur people speak a language closer to Turkish than Chinese and practice Islam. And that's made them a target for an aggressive campaign of assimilation with allegations of torture and disappearances. It is a genocide, well-planned and executed, executed uh, soft, uh, with the sophistication by the Chinese government. Bob Ray, Canada's ambassador to the UN, says he's asked the UN's human rights body to investigate. There's no question that there's... Um, aspects of what the Chinese are doing that fits into the definition of a genocide in the Genocide Convention. The Chinese already made it clear last month they don't welcome Ray's work on the issue. Canada always poses as a lecturer on human rights, despite its own tarnished history in human rights. And this morning in Beijing, a foreign ministry spokesman launched a tirade against the Trudeau government. <laughs> Zhao Lijian said China's Uyghur population is growing rapidly, while Canada's population isn't. So maybe Canada is guilty of genocide. This evening, Canada's foreign minister held back from accusing China of genocide, but did call for an investigation. We have raised the issue both uh, publicly and privately, and we spoke with, along with 38 nations very recently to ask for independent experts to be able to assess the situation on the ground. On top of the detentions of the two Michaels and the battle over Hong Kong, a third front is opening up in the Cold War between Canada and China. Evan Dyer, CBC News, Chelsea, Quebec. Well, Joe Biden is ramping up the pressure as Donald Trump refuses to admit defeat. More people may die if we don't coordinate. Next on The National, as the COVID-19 crisis deepens, no sign of presidential cooperation. Why more gyms are opening even as restrictions tighten across Canada. Demand has skyrocketed, so our spaces are booked out uh, at least a month in advance. And pushing the big retailers to put their money where their mouths are. When we talk about supporting Black-owned businesses in a really meaningful way like that, we're also talking about supporting Black communities. The Canadian designer behind the 15% pledge. We're back in two.
Welcome back. By unanimous consent, the House of Commons is congratulating the next U.S. president and vice president and inviting them for a visit. In recognition of the extraordinary relationship between Canada and the United States, call upon the government to invite both to visit Parliament and to invite Mr. Biden to address Parliament at the earliest safe opportunity to do so. And just as that was happening, so was this. Joe Biden was doubling down on his Buy American plan, pledging to give government contracts only to companies that make their products in the U.S. Canada is hoping to sell them on a Buy North American plan instead. Biden also talked about the pandemic, of course. With a million more COVID infections in a single week, controlling this virus is a daunting challenge for the incoming president. As Paul Hunter tells us, especially since Team Trump still refuses to do a handover. Even though it's still fenced off, if you look carefully, you'll see it. The grandstand for the Inauguration Day parade being built this week right in front of the White House, which itself sits just behind those trees. Even as Donald Trump continues to challenge Joe Biden's victory and the presumption by almost everyone but Trump that it'll be Biden who walks past that grandstand on his way into the White House January 20th. Thank you very much. But meanwhile, as Biden himself underlined today, there's a pandemic to confront. More people may die if we don't coordinate. Slamming Trump for his refusal to now coordinate with Biden's team to help them prepare to combat COVID with lives at stake. If we have to wait until January 20th to start that planning, it puts us behind over a month, month and a half. Indeed, as U.S. COVID cases spike to record highs, lineups for testing in this country are monster. And they're happening in multiple states. This is Alaska. Chicago has now issued a stay-at-home advisory as people stock up grocery shelves again emptying. We're going into a very dark winter. Today, Biden, with a vaccine now looming, called on Trump to help him be ready for the rollout. What's the game plan? It's a huge, huge, huge undertaking. Earlier, Biden met with U.S. business leaders on plans to revive the U.S. economy, but emphasized defeating COVID itself is the top priority. As for whether Trump will come around and help, said Biden. I am hopeful that the president will um, be mildly more enlightened uh, before we get to January 20th. But Trump today gave no signal he's heading that way, tweeting this morning, quote, I won the election, even though he didn't. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. Overseas in Japan, the president of the International Olympics Committee says he is very confident that spectators will be able to attend the Tokyo Games next year. We know uh, that uh, we will uh, even have uh, more COVID countermeasures in, in our toolbox. He says they want to convince as many people as possible to accept potential vaccines. More than 11,000 international athletes are expected to participate in the event in July. Ping me and I've got to self-isolate because somebody I was in contact with a few days ago has developed uh, COVID. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson posted this video from quarantine. He says he received the notification from the UK's health services tracing app. Johnson says he, quote, is as fit as a butcher's dog and we'll continue to work via Zoom. Okay, still ahead. Uh, my conversation with a Canadian designer putting big pressure on big retailers. 2020 is calling on all of us to be greater. Aurora James on the 15% pledge to source more products from black creators. But first, if you're skeptical about today's news of Moderna's vaccine showing promising results, stay with us because we are putting some of your concerns to the experts. We'll be right back. Welcome back. One week after Pfizer announced promising results from its COVID-19 vaccine candidate, its rival, Moderna, now has a vaccine candidate that could be just as effective. All this coming at a critical time in the pandemic as case numbers continue to increase. Now, to walk us through what all of this means, infectious diseases specialists, Dr. Zane Chagla and Dr. Susie Hoda. 
uh, Dr. Chaglet, maybe you can start just by explaining the basics here. So, so nearly 95% effectiveness of the Moderna vaccine, what does that actually mean? How did they arrive there? So breaking down the numbers, they took 15,000 people, gave them placebo, so gave them you know, a saline shot. They took 15,000 people and gave them the Moderna vaccine. And they followed them along to see how many of these people actually developed symptomatic COVID-19. In the group that got the placebo vaccine, 90 of them developed symptomatic COVID-19, whereas in the group that got the Moderna vaccine, five of them got symptomatic COVID-19. And so you can see there's a huge difference here between those two groups. Right. But Dr. Hoda, I, I've seen this question come up over and over again. If you're talking about, I guess, 90 plus five, like isn't 95 people a, a tiny sample size? Like why are we so sure that the end result will be anywhere close to 95 percent efficacy? I know it sounds like a very small number, but the dip, the big um, thing to focus on is a difference between those groups. So what we call it effect size, and the effect size appears to be uh, very noticeable uh, between the placebo arm and those that received the vaccine. So when there's a large effect size like that, you can say that with more confidence um, with a smaller number of people reaching that final outcome that they measured. Dr. Hoda, is, is there any reason to think that these results wouldn't hold up in the real world? Like a, a difference between the way the trials are carried out, the people on which they're carried out of, and how real life actually is? I think it's really important to know just how representative the trial participants are of the general public in the U.S. And it certainly looks like they um, tried to put in efforts to make sure that they were representing different types of groups of people uh, in terms of age range, in terms of ethnic background, uh, in terms of those that have other underlying health conditions um, to make sure that this is a little bit more sort of valid, I guess, in the real world scenario. With the numbers that we're seeing in the interim analysis, um, I'd be surprised if it deviates too far from that um, once we finalize the trial results and those are reviewed. Um, but of course, we have to wait and see what the final results are to know for sure. Right. Dr. Chagla, I, I have seen lots of questions about the length of immunity. Uh, and we get this question all the time. How long will the vaccine protect People. Yeah, that's. A, I mean, that's the the million dollar question. I think we're starting to see that it is effective at a certain interval, particularly right after you get the second dose. Um, there is data from the phase one and phase two trials that show that the antibody effects last for some amount of time. You know, a few months after the initial injection, it's still unclear whether or not that translates. You know, a few months later into protection against the virus. Uh, I think, you know, most indications are from the basic science data, but again, it, there's often a, a disconnect sometimes when you jump from the basic science to the clinical trials, and that's something we'll learn as these trials continue to follow patients along. Mm. Uh, Dr. Hoda, we got th this question about sort of what exactly the vaccine is capable of. Have a listen. This is from Jamie Sire in Alberta. What is the difference between a vaccine keeping you from becoming sick and keeping you from spreading the virus further to other people. In other words, if a vaccine can keep you from falling ill, why might it not prevent you from spreading the virus further? Yeah, so it's an interesting question, right, Dr. Oda? Could you get the vaccine, maybe not get sick, but still transmit it somehow? It is possible. And so to answer that question, you have to think about what it is that we're measuring within the trials and what, what's feasible to measure. So these vaccine trials are looking at symptomatic disease developing in those that get vaccinated or the placebo. That's what the primary outcome is. Um, it's a lot harder to understand whether they could have transmitted to other people. That takes a whole other design. Um, so, you know, ultimately, we have to think about also what we want to gain with the vaccine. And if we're able to prevent symptomatic illness, and particularly severe illness, as uh, it implies with this one vaccine, I think that's what the ultimate goal is. Because even if there is a little bit of forward transmission, it's not going to result in much impact in the overall population. Right. Providing enough people uh, get vaccinated, I suppose. Uh, Dr. Chagas, Correct. what do we know about how safe the vaccines are and, and also in terms of side effects, what those might be? Yeah, I mean, again, a lot of this is released by press release. Uh, and so, you know, from the data set that, that was released by Moderna on their website, the, the significant or serious adverse events were fairly minimal and balanced between the placebo arm and the vaccine, which is suggestive of 
uh, there being no major safety side effects. I think, you know, as this is a vaccine that really does stimulate one's immune system, many of the side effects reported are ones that we associate with a robust immune response. So pain at the injection site, fever, chills, feeling a bit off for a day or two uh, are all reported with the vaccine arm. And again, that would be consistent with a vaccine that's causing an immune effect similar to other vaccines we have on the market, like the shingles vaccine or the measles vaccine. And, and Dr. Chagla, is there any reason to think that the way this vaccine provokes the immune response could be dangerous in any way? And I'm thinking of, I mean, it's sort of giving your body genetic instructions to create a part of, I mean, a protein, right, of this coronavirus? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think to use the analogy of a car, essentially it's it's giving the, the instructions on how to make a license plate. So a piece of the car that's recognizable uh, that one could, you know, identify a car with, but not necessarily enough to actually be able to drive around. So all this vaccine is doing is giving us the one piece, enough for our immune system to start turning on, but not enough to do anything else with it other than just have that one piece and, and not generate a whole virus in that sense. Well, hey, uh, we have to leave it there, but Dr. Hoda, Dr. Chagla, this has been uh, wonderfully informative. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. All the best. And we do know there are many vaccines in the works, of course, worldwide, so we are tracking all of them. You can head on over to cbcnews.ca slash vaccine tracker for more. And next, the Canadian driving the campaign to make retailers do better. We need to hold these corporations accountable for doing their part. A conversation with designer and entrepreneur Aurora James about getting major retailers to commit in writing to the 15% pledge. Welcome back. In the last few months, it can feel like American politics has moved both at warp speed and at a snail's pace. But caught in the middle of that sea of change is a Canadian working to hold some of the U.S.'s biggest players to account. Through the 15% pledge, she urges companies to source more products from black creators, a campaign that grabbed headlines this spring. And to think, for Aurora James, it all started with a pair of shoes. <laughs> She is a fashion designer, an entrepreneur, and someone with a knack for turning long odds into a playable hand. I started with the goal of working with craftsmen and women all across Africa. Almost 10 years ago, a one-off trip to Africa turned into an eye-opening experience. In the work of local artisans, where she saw ingenuity, she also saw craft being undervalued and increasingly ignored. So she got to work. The company is called Brother Vellies, and I design shoes. Now, she's the creator and founder of Brother Vellies, an international luxury accessories brand, but one that continues to see African artisans as partners, not commodities. And her outlook has garnered a large following, some interested in her, some in the brand, but many in her politics. She's lent firepower to the Biden-Harris ticket, collaborated with an organization founded by Michelle Obama to get the vote out, and has unapologetically shined a spotlight on what she sees as four years of lost ground. Aurora James and I connected recently to talk about it all. Okay, so Aurora, it's, uh, it's Andrew calling. Very nice to, to be able to touch base with you. Oh, absolutely. It's a pleasure. I'm calling from Toronto. I, I, I wonder if that makes you a little bit homesick. Oh my gosh, every time I hear from Canada, it makes me incredibly homesick. But you know, it's not horrible um, being in America this month in particular, so. Let's talk about that. Uh, President-elect Biden, Vice President-elect Kamala Harris. How do those two things sound to you? Oh my gosh, you know, I have to be honest, I moved to America right before Barack was sworn in. And I have to say that was such a surprise for me, just being a Canadian, I think I kind of understand the intuitive differences between Canadians and Americans. And I just thought it was gonna be a really long road before we ever saw a you know, Jamaican Tamil woman in office in the United States of America. But gosh, I couldn't be more excited, you know? But make no mistake, it has been a difficult summer. In the days after George Floyd was killed by police, James was struck by how powerfully Americans reacted, but how ultimately it felt a bit empty. It's just kind of seeing all of these emails in my inbox and all these messages on Instagram from corporations that were saying, you know, I stand with you, I support you as a black woman. And I was reading it, but I definitely wasn't believing it. 
And I think the business side of me sort of needed to talk to the more wounded side of my human and say, like, what sort of major commitment would I need from the private sector right now, from major retailers to actually make me feel like they were standing with me as a black woman in America? So the 15 percent pledge. This idea of, you know, like 15%, for example, of shelf space of a major retailer being devoted to black owned businesses. What does that accomplish? So much, you know, so much. Most of the major retailers actually carry below 2% right now. Okay. So we're talking about a major leap here. And when we talk about supporting black owned businesses in a really meaningful way like that, we're also talking about supporting black communities. Black founders are more likely to employ black people. Um, we're seeing with the pandemic that people of color have been hit the hardest and really drastically. Their entire communities are being affected and also decimated. And the best thing that we can do at this point is to actually find those entrepreneurs and support them in really meaningful ways because it means uplifting entire communities. What we can't do is rely on our government to come in and save us in this moment. And we need to hold these corporations accountable for doing their part. To date, more than 100,000 people have signed their support to the 15% pledge, and a few major retailers have too. Sephora, West Elm, Rent the Runway, and Indigo here in Canada. So what is a company actually committing to, and, and how are they held accountable? Because that, that's the tough part, right? That's such a good question. So the accountability part is like the major element of it here. And um, what's wonderful is that these are multi-year contracts that these retailers are signing. So we're actually going to be checking in with them every quarter and working on hitting these tangible goals. It's not something that we want anyone to do overnight, right? So for example, if someone's at 3% now, the goal might be to double that or add one or 2% every quarter. So we really kind of benchmark it out with them so that we can work towards hitting tangible tangible goals and doing it in a way that's going to serve everyone. And just so I'm clear, when you say contract, we're not, we're not talking about just a sort of ethereal social contract. We're, you're, you're talking about pen to paper mm -hmm. contract. We need pen to paper right now. Yes, there's pen to paper contracts that are happening here with all of these major retailers. It's incredibly important. I have to ask you, is, is there a cynical side or a skeptical side inside of you that wonders if the companies that have signed on, even this is, is performative? in a way yeah you know i mean ugh, it's tough because corporations have to protect their bottom line so do i always think that they're going to put the pledge at the first and foremost of what their um you know goals are no i think if they have a really bad season if we see that stores are closed across america again you know in a really major way they're going to have to first make sure that they're not shuttering their doors because that's not going to help anyone anyways but, you know, in all of these conversations that I've had, I do have a lot of faith. And I think 2020 is calling on all of us to be greater and to find the words and to fumble the ball and still keep playing the game. We are discussing incredibly complex ideas right now about race, identity, and gender, all of these things with a kindergarten vocabulary. And we all need to be more confident in asking questions and um, being brave and standing up for each other. So what is it, do you think, that has sort of driven you to do what you do? Oh my gosh, you guys are going to call me crazy here, but I actually think it might be being Canadian, you know? <laughs> You got to explain that one for me. It's such a huge part of my DNA and my purpose. You know, I went to elementary school with kids that looked like me and looked absolutely nothing like me and everything in between. We celebrated all of our holidays. We shared our cultural traditions with each other. I lived in Kensington Market for four years in Toronto. It's like, you know, we're all there, like working with each other. Oh, what kind of pepper do you have? Like, you know, it's just a... We're a giant family in Canada, and um, that needs to be preserved at all costs. And that really is the foundation that um, made me who I am now. Well, I think we can all cheers to that. Uh, Aurora James, it's been really wonderful talking to you. Thank you so much. My pleasure. <laughs> so I want to pick up on something you said. You talked about the companies that have taken up the pledge, yep. and, and you mentioned Indigo as a Canadian example. Yep. But is that it? Actually, it, it kind of is, and she's pretty bummed out about that, especially when you think about the Canadian pledge is actually broader than it is in the United States. So in, in the United States, it's a 15% pledge 
representative of the nearly 15% of the population that black people make up. In Canada, there's nowhere near that kind of, those kind of numbers. And so it, the pledge actually encompasses BIPOC communities in Canada, but the uptake, not very good. And the really big fish like Walmart and Target, not signed up. All right, well, we'll keep watching. So up next, the pivot happening in the fitness world to keep businesses alive. Demand has skyrocketed, so our spaces are booked out uh, at least a month in advance. Ditching group classes for personal pods and micro gyms right after the break. I'm Jamie Poisson, and tomorrow on CBC's Daily News podcast, Front Burner, as coronavirus cases spike in many parts of the country. We discuss what lessons were learned from the first wave and what lessons weren't. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back. Pandemic restrictions are once again forcing small businesses to adjust, with gyms among those trying to find a safe path forward. Now, some have had to close their doors, but Jacqueline Hansen shows us how others are adapting under new rules. One of the strengths of this Toronto gym is its sheer size. Right now, we're only allowed to have 10 people in our facility. We have 12,000 square feet. That allowed Philosophy Fitness to pivot from exclusively group fitness classes and personal training before COVID to pre-booked personal workout pods. We could put cardio equipment in there, a full set of weights, squat rack, barbells, you name it. We can put it in this pod. A Toronto spin studio is also promoting a personal experience. While group classes are still banned in the city, book a bike and ride solo. Room to breathe safely as possible is key. If you don't have those 10 people all in there necessarily at the same time, ramping up and breathing really hard all at the same time, you're reducing your exposure a little bit that way. SiloFit is embracing a completely private workout, transforming unused office space into micro gyms that can be booked for between $20 and $40 an hour. You can come in, um, obviously, depending on the local guidelines, with anywhere from one to eight people. SiloFit's business has been in the works since 2018, but COVID has made the model more desirable. The company opened six locations in the past six months, including two new ones in Toronto just today. Demand has skyrocketed, so our spaces are booked out at least a month in advance. As winter approaches and outdoor fitness becomes far less doable, innovating indoors may be key to staying active. I think these uh, indoor opportunities are wonderful if they can be done safely. If they can, if they can follow the recommended uh, guidelines, I think they're great. But adapting old business models to new strict safety guidelines also comes at a heavy financial cost. If this continues, it, any, any business person will tell you that it doesn't make financial sense. For now, doing whatever it takes to buy time. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. Well, next on The National, speaking of time, Christmas is still nearly six weeks away, but that is not stopping some New Brunswickers from decking the halls. The reason why is our moment. Andy McMullen's house doesn't always look like this nearly six weeks before Christmas, but with the pandemic dragging on, he just decided his neighborhood needed a little lift. So he pulled out his Christmas lights. The why behind his early decorations is our moment. The current state of things, it's we're hoping to bring some joy to people. Um, you know, hopefully we don't get too many of the, oh, it's only November, don't put your lights up yet. You know, in previous years, it was like, I want to hold off Christmas for a while because it's, you know, it means it's the end of the year, it's, it's going to be snowy, but uh, I've sort of given in to the spirit and kind of yeah, puts a smile on people's face. It's getting darker out, so it's kind of nice to come home and you see the lights all lit up and the kids really enjoy it. And it's much easier to lay out the lights when they're not frozen, like the, the, the wire is, is a little looser. And we had a bunch of uh, Halloween lights up. So it came time to take that down and we were like, well, we could take it all down and then, you know, in two or three weeks, put something up for Christmas or just wrap it all with Christmas lights. And there's so much negativity uh, in the last little while, uh, you know, with the pandemic going on and every little bit that, that you can do helps. You know, sometimes all it takes is, you know, one person saying, have a great day to, to make a difference for someone. And I like to think this is our nice lit up, have a great day. True. 
Come exactly. On. There are no rules. Go for it, Andy. And I have to say, the one thing I've kind of enjoyed about the pandemic, the only thing, is that people's homes have become like the refrigerator doors of the nation. It's where kids put their artwork on, on the windows, and I bring it. I like it. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm normally, I will say, firmly in the camp of, of no Christmas decorations, at least until December, but... He makes a lot of sense. He does. And, and my own kids actually begged us to put, start putting up Christmas decorations this weekend. And we did. Ah. So, whatever. That's the National for this November 16th. Have a great night. Good night.